OK, so welcome everyone to our family faith formation for Sacred Heart Parish of Gladwin, Michigan and St. Athanasius Parish of Harrison, Michigan. We are excited to have with us Casey Trulove, who will be speaking on Eucharistic Adoration. Thank you, Casey. You're welcome. Welcome. Um, may I share my screen, Minda? Yes. Awesome. All right. Here we go. Everybody should be able to see okay there. Let me uh, reach my screen one more. All right, so before we get into Eucharistic adoration, I want to lay down one fundamental concept, and it's that the Eucharist is Jesus. Now, many of you might know this already, but we as Catholics need to grasp this fact. Everything else flows from this point. In fact, we call the Eucharist the source and summit of our faith. So when I say that everything else flows from this point, I mean it. The, the Eucharist is the source of our faith. If we aren't getting this first premise, our whole notion of Catholicism will be off. I know this because I was there. I went to Catholic school from preschool through high school graduation. I thought I was a good kid. I went to Mass on Sundays. I fell away a bit in the middle of high school, but came back very strongly in my senior year and always did well in religion classes. Yet despite all that, by the time I graduated, I didn't realize something as elementary as the fact that the Eucharist is Jesus. So I know firsthand that there have been massive holes in our Catholic education, both in schools, in parishes, and in families. So again, what is our main premise? The Eucharist is Jesus. Let's say this a little more explicitly. Does everyone know what I mean when I say the Eucharist? At Mass, we start with bread and wine, but God changes them into himself. That's the Eucharist. We call it Holy Communion, the Blessed Sacrament, the real presence of Jesus, etc. And they're all beautiful ways of describing that this thing, it's, it's so uniquely special, this thing you'll only find in Catholic and Orthodox churches. When we go up to receive Holy Communion, it's not just a symbol of Jesus that goes into our bodies. Jesus himself goes into our bodies. Our bodies aren't just assimilating a piece of bread and a sip of wine. They're assimilating God himself into our bodies. And there are really five facts that every Catholic should know about the Eucharist. And this is number one. And it's number one because it's the foundational idea, right? Everything else comes from this understanding that it is Jesus. In fact, we can't even call it bread or wine anymore because it's not. When you and I go up to receive Holy Communion, we're not receiving bread or wine. It's no longer bread or wine. It's been fundamentally changed into Jesus himself. And we call that fundamental change a change in substance. Now, substance is the philosophical term for what something is. So we say what it is changes. However, how it appears does not change. So many people say that two miracles occur at every Mass. The bread and wine change into Jesus, and God preserves the appearance of bread and wine. In philosophical terms, the appearance of a thing is called its accidents. That is, Everything science can measure, how it looks, how it feels, tastes, smells, sounds, even its chemical and physical reactions. Right? So the Eucharist, in it, all of the scientific properties of bread and wine remain. So people who are sensitive to gluten can be sensitive to the precious body. And if someone tries to drink too much of the precious blood, he or she could get intoxicated. So we say that the substance changes but the accidents remain the same. We call this change transubstantiation. That's just a fancy term for change in substance or what it is changes. That is, it is Jesus. 
but it appears to be bread or wine. Point number two is we believe because he said so. The second half of John chapter six is often called Jesus' bread of life discourse. In it, Jesus tells the crowd that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have life. And then the crowd kind of balks at this. They're like, what's he talking about? This is cannibalism. God doesn't allow cannibalism. And Jesus doesn't stop them. He doesn't say, wait a second, wait a second. I was speaking symbolically. No, he actually intensifies his language. Right? He comes, he starts out using the Greek term uh, foggy, right? Which, which is more like to consume. You have to consume me. Somehow you have to get me inside you, right? Uh, but after verse 51, when he goes into verse 53, the 52 is where they respond. 53, Jesus changes to trogon, which is like the, the verb for like a jackal gnawing the flesh off of a, a carcass, right? So not only is he saying like, you have to eat me, he's like, you have to gnaw on my flesh, right? And that's after people say, eh, I don't really understand what you're saying. This is kind of crazy. He actually intensifies it. And because of this, many of his disciples left him. They weren't willing to trust what he was telling them. Later, Jesus, at the Last Supper, gave us the Eucharist, saying, take, eat, this is my body. And then drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So not only did he give the Eucharist, but he ordained the apostles as the first priests of this new covenant by telling them, do this in memory of me. Right? So he gives them the Eucharist. This is my body. This is my blood. And then he says, do this. Right? He's saying, you are going to be the first priests. So we see at the Last Supper, Jesus wasn't just having one last meal with his apostles. He was instituting a new covenant with a new worship ceremony that includes a new gift for his people. The gift of himself that would nourish our souls as we journey through life. And later on in the New Testament, we see the apostles doing just what he said. Right after Pentecost, we see they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. Right? That was one of the early terms for the Mass. Right? In fact, the term Mass wouldn't be coined for quite a while later. So they had various terms that they were using for what we today call the Mass. And obviously the breaking of the bread being one of the, the easiest ones to think about. And, and then later, St. Paul mentions the bread and cup being a participation in the body and blood of Christ. These are not mere symbols, but actually participating in Jesus' body and blood. And then, not only that, he follows it up by warning people that if they don't treat the Eucharist properly, they'll be profaning the body and blood of the Lord. And in doing so, it's such a serious offense that they'll be bringing judgment on themselves. And when they use judgment in the biblical sense here, they're saying they're condemning themselves, right? If I don't treat this properly, I go to hell. So St. Paul's giving us a very serious warning. He's driving home the point that since this is really Jesus, we need to treat the Eucharist seriously. If we're treating God Almighty like he's just a piece of bread, we're committing a serious offense against God. Point number three is that all of Jesus is present in every crumb or drop. That is, no matter how much or how little you receive, you receive all of Jesus. So if all you get is a little crumb or a little drop, you get all of Jesus. So if, if Father's actually ever about to run out of hosts, he can break them in half to make sure that everyone receives Holy, Holy Communion. This is why also Father so meticulously purifies the communion vessels after communion and then drinks the water with which he is purifying. Because he has to make sure there's no chance of leaving Jesus inside the chalice or ciborium and having us ignore him. That said, though, if you ever receive Holy Communion on the hand and there's crumbs left over on your hand, they're Jesus. So don't brush our Lord off onto the floor to be trampled over. If you feel crumbs left over, reverently bring them to your mouth to be received. Also, if you're only able to receive the precious body, as many of us are right now, you don't receive any less of Jesus. No matter how much or how little you get, you still receive all of Jesus. 
Point number four is that for any sacrament to occur, not just the Eucharist, you have to have the correct matter, form, minister, and intention. In the case of the Eucharist, the matter or the stuff is unspoiled bread made only of wheat and unspoiled natural grape wine. The form, the, the words and celebration needs to happen, is the celebration of Holy Mass according to the words in the Missal, that big book on the altar that Father has. Right? Especially the words, this is my body and this is the chalice of my blood. And there's actually a, a funny story about this. Prior to 1970, Mass in the Western Rite was only offered in Latin. And the Latin for this is my body is hoc est enim corpus meum. Well, sometime probably around the 1600s, there were some people who did juggling or magic tricks who must not have known their Latin very well because they took these words of power, hoc est enim corpus meum, and somehow it came out to them as hocus pocus. <laughs> and many magicians and jugglers took on those words as either a name or as the word that would enact their tricks. It's a funny history story, but it's interesting how it emphasizes the point that they knew Catholics believe these words are powerful. And they were just using the wrong ones out of context. So yes, these words are powerful and necessary for the consecration to happen. If Father doesn't say, this is my body, there's no Eucharist. There's no Mass. Right? And speaking of Father, we have the minister. Right? The only minister that can do this is either a Catholic or Orthodox priest or bishop. They're the only ones who've retained valid priesthood. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. And the last piece is the intention. Right? The intention, obviously, is to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus for three main reasons. So that his sacrifice on the cross is made present, and the priest can lead the congregation in re-offering that sacrifice to God the Father. So the faithful can adore him. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And so those who are properly prepared can receive him in Holy Communion. Now, there are a couple of points to note on this one. Since only Catholics and Orthodox have the intention of both making Jesus truly present and re-offering Jesus' sacrifice, only they have retained valid priests. Right? So you think of other denominations that have broken off of Catholicism, right? like Lutherans and Episcopalians, and Ang well, Anglicans really came before Episcopalians, but you get the idea. Um, you know, they may have had valid priests that broke away from Catholicism, but they couldn't retain valid priesthood because of their conception of what happens in their celebration, right? Uh, both Luther, Zwingli, uh, King Henry VIII, <laughs> they, they all rejected the idea of the, the mass as a sacrifice, right? And so they lose what a, a priest does. A priest offers a sacrifice. So God only brings about the Eucharist through Catholic and Orthodox priests or bishops. Any other Christians who have a communion service only have a symbol of Jesus. And, and last point uh, on this is there's no chance of a priest accidentally consecrating the Eucharist. Right? He has to intend to consecrate all of the hosts. So if someone was going to try to hide hosts under the altar cloth or something like that, those hosts wouldn't accidentally become Jesus. The, the priest has to intend each of the hosts to become Jesus. And lastly, key to our discussion today is that Jesus' presence remains as long as the accidents of bread or wine remain. The first note here is to take, uh, is that our bodies, as they're assimilating Jesus, once there's no appearance of bread or wine, Jesus is no longer physically present. His spiritual presence remains with us, but his physical presence is gone. The second thing to note is that any leftover communion is still Jesus and will remain Jesus as long as its accidents remain that of bread or wine. All right, at the end of communion, if we didn't consume all of the Eucharist, the precious blood is consumed, but the precious body is safely stored in the tabernacle. I find this part of Mass interesting. Often, uh, the, the church talks about how we relive the whole Paschal mystery during Mass. So the Paschal mystery is Jesus' passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, earlier in the Mass, the consecration of bread and wine separately showed that we're being made present at the cross, right? 
Jesus at the Last Supper was showing that he was taking his disciples outside of time and putting them the next day, that they would be present at the cross where his body and his blood were separated. Okay? And even today, we're taken outside of time and brought back to the cross at Mass. Right? And then later, a piece of the precious body in Mass is broken off and mingled with the precious blood, showing that we're being made present at Jesus' resurrection, where his body and blood are reunited. Now, I sometimes like to think of Father putting Jesus back into the tabernacle, kind of like showing that we're made present at Jesus' ascension. He, he goes up to the tabernacle, and then he's taken away from our sight, this time by tabernacle doors instead of clouds. But there Jesus remains in the tabernacle all week, waiting for us to visit him. Not only has Jesus brought his presence to us who received him in Holy Communion, but he has also left his presence in the tabernacle for us to come and spend time with him throughout the week. This is Jesus fulfilling his promise at the very end of Matthew. I will be with you always to the close of the age. Jesus waits for you to spend time with him. And I've heard it put that he makes himself a prisoner of love inside that tabernacle. The God who created the universe merely by thinking about it confines himself to remain present under the appearance of bread. And he allows himself to be stored away just so you can come and visit him. Right? God doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do any of this. Making himself present, feeding himself to us, remaining there for us throughout the week, and everything else he has done. It's not for his benefit. He doesn't get anything out of it, right? He's completely perfect in and of himself. So he doesn't gain anything by doing any of this. It's all out of love for us, to be with us, to help us be closer to him now and throughout eternity. And he wants you to be close to him. And he wants to be close to you. He wants to spend forever with you. But that forever starts now. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Father Francis Fernandez, but he's got an amazing seven-book series that basically gives a three-part homily for every day of the year. It's called In Conversation with God. It's full of great practical wisdom for how to live out the Catholic faith each day, especially how to offer up your ordinary work each day as a sacrifice to God. But in that series, he wrote, Jesus is there in the nearest tabernacle, perhaps just a few miles away or even a few yards away. How could we not go to see him, to love him, to tell him about our affairs, to ask him for things? What a lack of consistency on our part if we were not to do this with faith. How easy it is to understand that centuries-old custom of the daily visits to the divine tabernacles. And this is what we're talking about today. Visiting Jesus in the tabernacle outside of Mass. Spending time with Jesus in the Eucharist, right? We call it Eucharistic adoration. Now, obviously, Eucharistic refers to spending time with Jesus' true presence in the Eucharist, whether that's with Jesus in the tabernacle, like in this image, or with Jesus exposed in the monstrance. We'll see an image like that later. There are even ways of honoring Jesus in the Eucharist when you aren't able to enter a church. So again, Eucharistic obviously refers to the Eucharist. To understand the word adoration, let's pull from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, the Catechism is the big book of what the Church officially teaches. It was commissioned and promulgated by St. John Paul II and largely written by then Cardinal Ratzinger and now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Here we read that adoration is the first attitude of man, acknowledging that he is a creature before his creator. It exalts the greatness of the Lord who made us and the almighty power of the Savior who sets us free from evil. Adoration is homage of the Spirit to the King of glory, respectful silence in the presence of the ever greater God. Adoration of the thrice holy and sovereign God of love blends with humility and gives assurance to our supplications. So adoration means that we're worshiping him as God. We recognize that he is God and we are not. We love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, being, and strength. 
We love him above all things, money, power, pleasure, comfort, etc. So Eucharistic adoration is primarily worshiping the Eucharist as God. But it also includes all the other prayers that we might bring while we're spending time with Jesus in the Eucharist. Jesus wants us to spend time with him so we can know him and love him. As my pastor often says, you can't love what you don't know and you won't share what you don't love. Jesus calls you and I to carve out time to spend with him. Imagine you have a grandpa whom you love deeply, but he's confined to his bed. Imagine your family makes it a special point to visit him every Sunday. But the rest of the week, grandpa would sit, waiting for visitors. If you happen to be on that side of town, knowing how much he loves you and loves to see you and how lonely he must be, would you stop by grandpa's house? If he could see outside from his bed and you were in a rush, would you at least wave as you pass by the house or take a slightly longer route just to, so you could wave? We have someone even more important than a loving grandpa in the tabernacle. There's no more important relationship to build than with God himself. And he's calling each of us to carve out little bits of time between Sunday masses to spend time with him. And he wants to be in a relationship with you today. And we build relationships with others by spending time with them. And my relationship with my wife would grow very cold if I didn't spend any time with her. My relationship with Jesus is the same. Now, we can spend time with Jesus in prayer and in scripture, <clears throat> but we can spend even closer time with him by praying or reading scripture in his presence. This idea was heightened for me when my wife and I were courting and engaged. I was at school in Florida and she was living in Illinois. We noticed the vast difference in connection between communicating via email, text, phone, video chat, and then being in person, right? Video chat was so much better than email, text, or phone because we could see each other's faces. But it was so much better than that when we could actually be in each other's presence. With Jesus, it's similar. We can deepen our relationship with prayer, but there's an extra deep connection we can make doing that prayer in his presence. You know, St. Teresa of Calcutta, otherwise known as Mother Teresa, said, the time you spend with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the best time that you will spend on earth. Each moment that you spend with Jesus will deepen your union with him and make your soul everlastingly more glorious and beautiful in heaven and will help you bring about an everlasting peace on earth. I mean, it's like, that, that's my talk, right? <laughs> All done. St. Teresa of Calcutta recognized that we're in a spiritual battle. We're constantly being bombarded by the attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And she knew her sisters, the missionary of charity, were called to fight back by bringing God's love to the world. But she also knew that they first needed to be filled with God's love before they could bring it to others. She also said, it is necessary for every missionary of charity to feed upon the Eucharist in order to be a true carrier of God's love. She must live on the Eucharist and have her heart and life woven with the Eucharist. No missionary of charity can give Jesus if she does not have Jesus in her heart. So Mother Teresa had her nuns practice Eucharistic adoration multiple times a day. In fact, she said, to be able to give life like that, our lives are centered on the Eucharist and prayer. We begin our day with mass, holy communion, and meditation. Where do you think that meditation was happening? in front of the Eucharist, right? Then they go out in the world, they come back for lunch, housework, a little bit of rest, and they do an examination, liturgy of the hours, in front of the Eucharist, stations of the cross in the chapel, and then spiritual reading, probably in front of the Eucharist as well. Then tea and back out into the world, right? And then they come back in the evening for another hour of adoration. Then they do dinner, prep for the next day's work and a little bit of recreation and finish with night prayers. And then she said, once a week, we have a day of recollection where the sisters spend extra time in adoration instead of going out to work. She said, this is a time when we can regain our strength and fill up our emptiness again with Jesus. 
That's why it's a very beautiful day. So just like the missionaries of charity, each of us is called to bring God's love to the world in our own way. God has a mission for you that no one else can perform. God is sending you to everyone around you to bring them his love, to wake them up from simply being focused on the material life and what the media tells them is important, to be a shining light in the darkness of this world, pointing people to something better, something worth living for, something worth giving your life for. But we'll only give this example by loving like God. We fulfill our mission, our purpose in life, by infusing everything we do with love for God and for other people. Work life, family life, personal life, everything. Now, God has called most of us to an ordinary life, like how he lived in Nazareth for his first 30 years. But like him, he calls us to live that ordinary life in an extraordinary manner. Ordinary, everyday life can be offered up to God. Our thoughts, words, and actions can be filled with love. But we'll only be able to give that love if we let God fill us first. And one of the best ways to be filled with God's love is to put ourselves in his presence. Again, God has sent you on a mission to the people around you. And though you may not be worthy of that call, you may not be very skilled in speaking or in studying, but he wishes to equip you for your mission. He's especially provided you himself in Holy Communion and the ability to visit him in the tabernacle, or like in this image, in the monsters. Well, if we're going to spend time in adoration, what do we do while we're there? St. Alphonsus answered this question saying, what should we do, you sometimes ask, in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? Love him, praise him, thank him, and ask him for things. What does a thirsty person do when he sees a pure, clean fountain? Jesus' Eucharistic presence is a pure, clean fountain of God's life and love. We call it the source and summit of the Christian life because it's both the source by giving us that life and love to fulfill our mission, but it's also the summit, the height, the goal of the whole Christian life, being ever closer to God and drawing as many other people as possible to him. As we spend time in God's presence, he acts on us like a radiating sun. In the presence of such intense heat, our job is to prevent our hearts from being like clay that will harden from this heat. We can think of Pharaoh, when Moses brought him God's message, he kept his heart like clay, and so God's heat hardened his heart. Rather, we want our hearts to be like wax. Right? We want to melt any resistance to God's work. We want to be filled with his life, his love, and allow his inspiration to guide our daily activities. St. Alphonse Salgori also said, Know that you will probably gain more by praying 15 minutes before the Blessed Sacrament than by all other spiritual exercises of the day. True, our Lord hears our prayers anywhere, for he made the promise, ask and you shall receive. But he has revealed to his servants that those who visit him in the Blessed Sacrament will obtain a more abundant measure of grace. We go back to uh, Father Fernandez, right? The more time we spend in adoration, the more it's going to affect us. He said that the visit to the Blessed Sacrament is an act of piety that only takes a few minutes. Nevertheless, what a lot of graces and what fortitude and peace does our Lord give through it. There we find that our sense of presence of God throughout the day is improved. And we gather new strength to take the difficulties of the day in our stride. There our desire to work better is enkindled. And we're provided with a good supply of peace and joy to take with us to our family life. Our Lord, who always pays generously, is grateful for the fact that we have gone to visit him. So our Eucharistic adoration not only builds our relationship with God, but gives us extra graces to better handle the challenges of life and to better live the life to which he's called us. You see, 
He calls each of us to great love in small ways. And by spending time with him, he gives us what we need to be able to love so deeply. You know, it wasn't until I was 23 that I realized that the Eucharist was Jesus. I'd grown up Catholic, attending Catholic school until high school graduation. Despite trying to live a Catholic life, I was a very worldly person. And as such, I developed some very unhealthy worldly habits. One day, in an effort to answer some of my Protestant friends' comments about purgatory, I came across Catholic.com. I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but it's pretty informative. Not only was my idea of purgatory totally wrong, but they showed me why we believe in purgatory historically, logically, and biblically. As I read that, my mind was blown. This whole new horizon had opened up that I'd never known. I realized that there was probably a ton of Catholic stuff that I didn't know about. So I decided to read more on their site. And eventually I came to an article on the Eucharist and my mind again was blown away. Catholicism instantly became infinitely deeper. You know, earlier that year, I was taught how to really pray the rosary, not simply just saying our fathers and Hail Marys. And I'd started a habit of trying to go to my local church. This, this church is Immaculate Conception in Traverse City. That's where I grew up. And I would go there on my lunch break and I'd try to pray a rosary, uh, get it fit in by the time I had to get back to work. However, once I understood the Eucharist, this time of rosary in the church took on a whole new depth and God totally blessed it. He not only broke my unhealthy habits, but he provided opportunities for me to learn more about him. He developed a greater and greater love for him and his church. And he gave me a passion for helping others know and love him and his church. And he gave me opportunities to share what I continue to learn. Eventually leading me back to school for a master's degree in theology. He led me to find my beautiful super Catholic wife. And he's provided many jobs and ministries across the country and back to provide for our family and help us to draw souls closer to him. And all of that started simply by spending time with him. Now, one last topic I wanna to discuss is reverence. One way we cultivate our love for Jesus in the Eucharist and foster it in other people is by the reverence we offer toward the Eucharist. How well do we respect the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, both inside and outside of mass? The more you spend time with Jesus, the more natural this will become. But let's con consider a few ways of showing that respect. When we enter a Catholic church, we show our initial sign of respect by genuflecting in his presence. Right? To genuflect is to bend your knee. Now, traditionally, we Catholics touch our right knee to the floor in this sign of respect. The knee has historically been, historically been seen as a sign of power and bending it is a display of recognizing that you're in the presence of a higher power and that you submit your power to his will. It's also a way of lowering yourself in God's presence. Again, showing that he is God and you are not. When we genuflect, it's also a tradition to say, my Lord and my God. In fact, there's an indulgence attached to just saying that when looking at the Eucharist, especially when you do a genuflection. So when we come into a Catholic church, we should find where the tabernacle is. After finding the tabernacle, we bend our knee to God inside as we come into his presence. Now, I know in your parish, Jesus used to be in a separate room. So you have to go to that room, genuflect, and then come into the church proper. I'm so glad that Father Vitelli brought Jesus into your sanctuary so he can be the center of the church. Let's never take that for granted. You have Jesus physical presence in your midst, in your church. When we come in, we point our bodies to him and genuflect toward him in a very reverent manner. We don't, don't genuflect toward the wall or the pew or nothing in particular, right? Having, having worked in multiple Catholic parishes with schools, I can't count the number of times I've redirected a student's genuflection. So he's actually giving honor to Jesus' true presence. Now, we don't want this ritual to become simply routine. So we can ask ourselves, how much love is put into our genuflection? Is it just a bob of the knee as you enter the pew? Or is it truly a sign of honor to your almighty king?
We also show our respect when crossing the middle of the church. Think about it this way. If you were to pass in front of your mother, would you ignore her? Or would you smile and say hello? Similarly, if you're passing in front of the king of the universe, should you ignore him? Or should you make some gesture of honor? We traditionally genuflect when crossing in front of Jesus. This not only expresses our respect for Jesus, but it helps teach others that Jesus is present in the tabernacle. Another sign of respect for Jesus is by keeping the room with his presence set aside as a room for prayer. We make a distinction between the place of prayer and the place of socializing. It's common to stay after Mass to offer prayers of thanksgiving. And by keeping the nave, the area with the pews, quiet, we allow people to better focus on their thanksgiving prayers. We also show Jesus respect by moving to a different room before starting social conversations. So the nave and the sanctuary, which is where the altar and tabernacle are, are special areas because of Jesus' presence. And that one way we show that specialness is by keeping them as places of prayer. Thankfully, your parish has a very large narthex, or gathering space, right, where people can go and talk after Mass. It's really awesome. So you can easily reserve the nave and sanctuary for prayer because social conversations can easily be moved to the narthex. Similarly, when we're outside a church and passing by but don't have time to stop in and be with Jesus, do we ignore him and just continue passing by? Or can we make some sign of reverence even from out here? One traditional way of showing this respect is by reverently making the sign of the cross as we pass by. I like to say, Jesus, I believe the blessed sacrament is you. I worship you and I love you. You can say any prayer that comes to the heart to show Jesus respect. All these little gestures build up a culture of respect for Jesus in the Eucharist. They deepen that culture within ourselves, and they either prime or deepen that culture in others. So to recap, the Eucharist is Jesus. After Mass, any leftover hosts are reserved in the tabernacle, and Jesus waits for you and I to visit him in Eucharistic adoration. He wants you to bring your whole life to him. And he wants to shower graces on you and your life. So please, spend time with him. Allow him to change your life for the better. Become that man or woman he created you to be. And by so doing, as St. Catherine of Siena said, you will set the world on fire. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions today? I see there's uh, one question in the chat. Oh, just a welcome, Casey. Do we have any questions about Eucharistic adoration or anything Catholic? You're welcome. Thank you. Feel free, uh, if you want, to either type in the chat or unmute yourself and ask a question. I'd be glad to answer anything, even if it's not about Eucharistic Adoration, anything you want to know. How about sitting quietly and do nothing but listen? That's a great prayer, actually, just listening to Jesus. The more you can sit and listen, the more you can really recognize his voice. Yeah, great commentary. Sorry if you can hear one of my children stomping up and down the hallway. Oh, good question. Are you technically a cannibal if you're eating Jesus? That's a great question. No, you're not, actually. Uh, A cannibal eats dead flesh, but we Catholics eat living flesh, the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. Great question. Great question. Another one that often comes up is, is do we Catholics, uh, are we allowed to receive communion in other churches? No, we're not. Uh, In fact, receiving Holy Communion in the Catholic Church is a sign that you are agreeing with every single thing the church teaches, that you are in fact a Catholic. So it's a sign of already belonging and not making a belonging uh, out of someone else, unless they're uh, converting, obviously. Um, So it does make us the church. um, But uh, when we say amen to 
this, you know, the body of Christ, we're saying, I believe that that's Jesus and that everything he's taught is, is being taught by the Catholic Church. And so we only receive communion in the Catholic Church. And that's why non-Catholics don't receive communion in the Catholic Church and we don't receive elsewhere. Any resources for families and helping take them to take children to adoration? There's some great resources out there. Um, uh, Catholic Sprouts. You guys have ever heard of Catholic Sprouts? It's a daily podcast for kids. Uh, they also have some coloring books. My wife, uh, she she bought those coloring books and brings the kids on Fridays usually, and the kids love them. They're these really great little adoration books. And there's a board book for the littlest ones. Um, it's it's a really good opportunity where they can just sit and be in Jesus' presence and color pictures of the saints while they're being with Jesus. So yeah, great opportunity. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to use Holy Heroes with kids, it's another great one. It's not necessarily for adoration, but it helps them prepare for Mass. And so again, it'll deepen that understanding of the Mass. Ah, great question. Could you speak a little on Eucharistic miracles, right? So what I said earlier is that usually two uh, miracles happen in every Mass. One, that the bread and wine change into the body and blood of Jesus. And two, that the um, appearance of bread and wine remains. Well, sometimes that second miracle doesn't happen. And throughout history, there have been a number of Eucharistic miracles where you can see human flesh and human blood that, that it, the Eucharist gets changed into. The most famous one is in Lanciano, Italy. Um, that one happened, I want to say like, I'm not going to give a date because it's a, I'm going to be way off. But in Lanciano, Italy, uh, there's a, a large host that was changed into human flesh. And it was actually uh, changed into myocardial flesh, right? So a piece of the heart. Um, and they noticed that the, um, the precision cut of the flesh would have been absolutely impossible in the time that that miracle happened. So uh, there's lots of different um, stories about Eucharistic adoration and all the scientists who've gone into it. Now, it's really interesting. The Vatican, when they go to, to investigate any, any alleged miracles, they send both Catholic scientists and non-Catholic scientists because they don't want a bias interpretation. Unfortunately, they keep running out of non-Catholic scientists because they keep converting to Catholicism when they, when they start investigating these uh, uh, miracles. So, awesome. Any other questions? These are great. Oh, yeah, there's a, um, my, my wife is in the chat right now and she's got some great uh, hints here. She, she put in an article on Eucharistic miracles. So check that out, be great. One person asked a little higher up, how many times a day may you mm. receive the Eucharist? Yeah, oh, good question. I used to know the answer to this one. Hold on, it's, um, I think you can receive I know it's at least twice. It could be three times or more. Um, but the after the first time, it can't be a, a communion service. It has to be at mass. So if you happen to go to a communion service in the morning and then later you're able to go to mass, you can receive communion again. Uh, and like obviously priests that are offering mass three times a day, they have to receive communion three times a day. So um, it, you know, I I'm don't quote me on that because I know there's a canon law and it's. Um, it's probably higher you know, now that I think about it. Um, so I can, I can find that answer if somebody wants that. Great question though. Many of us have friends or family who are not Catholic. Sometimes they feel excluded by not being able to receive the Eucharist. How would you suggest addressing this with them? That's a great question. I think a lot of it comes down to that idea that they think communion is this everybody's welcome meal and it, it's, it's trying to bring outsiders in, whereas it's more of um, an insider's meal. And so I guess it would be, be helpful to prep them before they come and recognize like in the Catholic church, when we receive communion, we're saying, I believe everything this church teaches, right? that I am a Catholic and I'm agreeing with the Catholic church. Um, and so for you to receive that would be a lie. Right? And not only is it a lie with your body, 
but it's a lie with Jesus' body. And so, you know, we, we look at St. Paul's warning very seriously. He who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats or drinks judgment on himself. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to commit sacrilege with God's body. And so I care for you, and I'm giving you this tough love here. It's not, it's not the easiest message to give, but it's the necessary message. <laughs> I, I remember, uh, gosh, it's probably 10, no, I'm only 15 years ago now, I brought a, a Protestant friend with me to a daily mass one time, and we're, we're on our way, and I'm, I'm explaining the whole idea of the Mass to him, and I explain, like, okay, so, you know, we believe the Eucharist is Jesus, and, you know, you can be with us, but just don't receive communion, and then, like, at communion time, I go up, and I receive Jesus, and I turn around, and he's right behind me receiving, I'm like, oh, I tried, I tried, um, fail on that one. So try to make it, you know, definitely explicit. I might, I might not have been uh, as like, focus on this one right here, big guy. Um, so. All right. Any other questions out there? You know, I, one of the, the interesting things about Eucharistic adoration is, you know, whereas we as Catholics can only receive the Eucharist, anyone can visit the Eucharist. And so if you wanted to bring your friends for adoration sometime, um, that's totally open. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I hope your parish uh, has, has very open hours so people can show up before or after work and and come in and spend time with Jesus. I know there are a lot of parishes who you know, lock their doors at like three o'clock or something like that and they can't make you know you just can't make it in. And so I, I'd say you know like hopefully you guys I, I assume because I know Father Portelli has a deep love for the Eucharist probably leaves the doors open a little longer. So that's pretty awesome. All right. Any other questions before we wrap up? Thoughts, comments from your experiences? Yeah, does anybody else have any great experiences of Eucharistic adoration? I think it has a calming effect on me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Those, those really come uh, the more you get in that, that relationship with Jesus. The deeper it goes, the, the more peace you get. Yeah. I know with myself, um, if there's something I'm trying to discern, really spending time with Jesus is yeah. uh, so important. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Great comment. Yeah, so you can actually visit from the parking lot. I've done that before, or like right outside the church when the church is locked. Yep, definitely done that. A year ago, we were doing that a lot, actually. Parking lot adoration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so you guys want me to close with prayer then? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gift of yourself in the Eucharist. We thank you for being able to reflect more on it today, and we ask you to please fill us more and more with your life and your love and a desire to visit you. Give us opportunities, Lord, to find you and to spend time with you transform us, turn us each into little magnets that draw other people closer to you. And hopefully those people also will find the joy of your presence in the Eucharist. Help us, particularly who have children, to pass a love for you onto our children. 
And we give all of this up to you through Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. you, Casey, so much. You're welcome. And, welcome. Uh, Glad to do it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.